Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar, radio production and distribution in the cloud. My name is Marko Juntunen and I'll be hosting this, this webinar for you today. And uh, today we have a, uh, three topics in, in our webinar. In the first part, uh, my colleagues from UTEL, Mr. Jorma Kivele and Mr. Olli-Pekka Lukkarinen will, will present the cloud native radio broadcasting platform. Uh, after that, uh, uh, Mr. Leif Cipriani and Barry Eskes from 2WCOM um, will, will present cloud native multimedia over IP network. And uh, after that, we have a special guest, Mr. Brian Wilson from CBS News Radio, sharing um, his experiences from radio production and distribution in the cloud. And um, we have a question and answer uh, uh, also, also included in this webinar. So you are, you are welcome to, to ask your questions. And at the end of the webinar, we will, we will answer to them. And, and we can also, also return to your questions after, after the webinar if we don't have time to, time to answer to all of those questions. And now I will I will uh, uh, give the webinar stage to Mr. Mr. Jorma Kivele. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I'm Jorma Kivele. I'm the CTO of uh, Utel Radioman, and my colleague here, Olli Pekka, is CEO of uh, Utel. And uh, and uh, today we are talking about uh, radio production. Uh, and in the cloud in this webinar. The, uh, the uh, cloud native uh, uh, radio production platform, it comes from UTEL. UTEL is one of the most uh, experienced radio automation providers in the world. Uh, the customers we have are mostly uh, large uh, national uh, commercial and uh, and uh, public broadcasting companies uh, and today we are talking about uh, our uh, next generation radio man solution that is cloud native uh, radio broadcasting platform and uh, uh, first uh, uh, with uh, the cloud native broadcasting platform, we, we mean that all the broadcasting operations can be run as a service from the cloud. And uh, uh, the user interfaces, they can be uh, all with uh, just uh, browser interfaces. Naturally, there can be large uh, studios uh, interconnected, but still the user interfaces are uh, browser-based. And uh, uh, the system which can run from many locations, it can run also uh, multiple channels uh, uh, and distribution to multiple uh, locations in the city uh, uh, around the uh, cloud and uh, also produce web radio streams uh, in the uh, system. The services within the uh, cloud, they are, uh, there's uh, planning functionality, there's media management possibilities, there's uh, audio production, playout, mixing, there's uh, distribution and distribution control. There's legal logging, archiving, streaming services. And um, uh, uh, with the cloud platform, it's uh, possible to, to start uh, looking out of the box concerning the broadcast business, because this gives lots of new possibilities and lots of new uh, business uh, process possibilities. 
And uh, before we go more deeply into the functionality uh, or func internal functions, I give a speech to Oli Pekka to show a little user interface demo to get a glimpse on what's available. Thank you. Let, let me share my screen. So I'm here. Uh, do you see my on-air screen? Okay. So this is our uh, studio or on-air screen. And uh, in this setup, our studio is of course in the cloud. Uh, it's called the media node. The user interface is browser-based. Overall view, but this is so that on the left side, uh, we do have a running order, your playlist. Uh, the currently playing uh, uh, item better now, there is a media info on the right side. And below the running order, there is a card wall or single seats, two of them. Left side goes for the channel uh, three usually, and right side to channel four. Playlist, uh, do I have a channel one and two that you can do crossovers and fadings as well. Uh, here in Finland, clock is now five o'clock in the evening. We are on air, which means that we have a music recording on. Uh, so this is the basic view of the on air. The playlist, uh, we do have a, a control buttons on the below of the playlist. We can have also another browser, for example, a tablet, where we have our, we do have a single and hotkeys and also the control buttons here. So if I press here, uh, go button, the on air playlist uh, will start to play. It start count for the better now music. If I want to join to the broadcast and listen what is happening in the cloud, I will connect. And this will bring me. This will bring me my faders where we can go more deeply soon. Uh, but uh, let me go back to the on air playlist. Uh, I can do voice tracking in on air, uh, for example. If I want to do voice tracking uh, between the next song and the song after that, uh, I can open here a fading tool, which will give me a, a possibility uh, to start the voice tracking uh, for this position. If I don't want to start exactly here, I can play the upper song. Uh, when I'm ready for recording, I click record. This will now record my voice. When I'm ready, I will fade out for the next audio. And finally, this is my audio clip, my voice tracking between the first and the second song. When I close this here, uh, it will do a succession for me based on the timestamp. And I'm using an admin account, uh, voice over admin and this timestamp. If I want to save it, it will appear in the in the schedule between these songs. Uh, I do have a search, uh, which will, uh, this is our, uh, all our material. I'm able to search also in on air. There are text elements, audios, songs, adverts. And there is also one view for latest arrivals which will always tell me what has been lately saved to the database. If I want to add material, let's say that I want to add one song, I can do a search and, um, okay, I want to have a dire straits so far away to be played soon. So I will drag it to the schedule, to the disposition. I have a pre listen available here. Uh, so that I can second that, okay, is this uh, song okay? And I can pre-listen the song. I can also do flagging here for the intro, outro, and so on, using the pre-listen window for this song. If I do flagging, I can choose if it goes only to this playlist or if it's a generally for this song. 
which is in the database. Uh, when I'm in the on air, uh, another person from another location can have the same user interface and we both have a capability to add songs. And we both have also capability to control the schedule. Uh, if we give user rights, it depends what user account you are locked to the system. Mm. Then we have a live, which means uh, that you can connect to the media node, which is on the cloud. You have your faders available here. If I'm playing something for the schedule, I can control the control the volume uh, for the song. And on the right side, there is a PCM, which is a mix uh, of the channels. I can do effects from the card wall, which will go to the another card player. And there is also for the first card player. I do have a possibility. Uh, uh, there is a talk, which is that I can contribute to the program wherever I am. Uh, so if I click the talk here, and uh, now I can see that from the right side, uh, the PCM output do have my volume. Uh, if I don't have a talk pressed, uh, this will not go to the PCM output. But okay, I want now to the contribute to the program. And if I have, uh, Another person in a different location, they can also join to the program. Uh, in this example, Sami was uh, listening this broadcast from another location. And you can see that his fader came visible when he clicked the talk. Sami, are you there? How are you doing? Oh, hello, Olli Pekka. I'm doing great. How is the webinar going? It's going very well, thank you. And I'm happy that we have so many attendees. Thank you, Sami. Excellent. I, Let's keep in touch. Bye. Actually, I can have, have it also on iPad and I can, I can do it also from here. Yeah, so Jorma just clicked the one card wall audio from there. We have also predefined sources on the right side of the live. Uh, for example, in this demo setup, we do have an outside broadcast venue, which could be a football match or ice hockey game or whatever. And then we have, can have a TV news, for example. Uh, we can select which one we want to direct to the program, and we can connect that stream. And immediately, we have this stream coming to our broadcast. And you can see I'm using web we have also a possibility to disconnect it. Similar way, we can have an external source element in a schedule in the running order on the left side, which means that, for example, every hour we can have a two minute news coming from the TV, for example, or, or some other program. All of these uh, operations, they are in AVS Cloud in uh, Sweden. And uh, so this is just a uh, user interface here in Finland. Yes, and for the output, uh, we are using RTP and SRT, and the communication through the browser, browser uses a WebRTC. Mm. Okay, so that was the overall of the on-air, but we do have also a planner. Uh, I will show that one also. So here we have on the right side, we have a day planning. You can see on top of the, of the so there are selection for different modules. So currently the day planning is chosen and it is shown here. And this is our program, what we are currently running. There is our voiceover also, which we just recorded. I can change order here and it will immediately affect to the on air as well. I just moved uh, one song uh, to Happier to be there just after the voiceover. So it immediately reflects. So there can be a producer uh, using the planner side, or the producer can also have the same visibility for the on-air. Then we have the same selection for uh, 
different media types and our MAM system. We have a search available here. We can plan our programs. We do have a long-term planning in a template planning. Uh, we can plan our park walls. Also here, we have a music scheduler. And of course, we have an administrator. We have, for example, uh, profiling users and managing our users. We have a playout history. We have possibility to see now playing information and so on. So this was a brief uh, demo for the, for the user interface. Thank you. And uh, now I will continue a little on the on the uh, presentation. So um, about uh, uh, broadcasting platform, we can have uh, uh, multiple uh, channels and we can have uh, many, many locations wherever we can have a large uh, IP based studios or just studios with uh, some small uh, 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 USB microphones or uh, USB mixers or just a laptop with a uh, headset or a tablet. And um, then uh, in, the, in the back end, if we look what there is, uh, we first have the radio and server back end. In the radio and server uh, back end, we have the media asset data, music data, uh, all the database stuff. We have also all the file storages, uh, audio files, other files. Uh, the workstations, they don't have the direct access, file access, so that uh, this is safe in the data security side. And uh, then we have file transcoders, EBU, R128 levelers, that kind of stuff, and the REST API to all the other services. Then we have different interfaces. We have in, uh, interfaces for music systems, music selection systems like select G selector, music master. We have also internal music selection. We have publishing interfaces to publish now, now playing in, information to a uh, network and also to publish uh, uh, podcasts and programs to websites and uh, publishing system and also interface for traffic to, to take the traffic uh, uh, information in the advertisements, that kind of stuff. Then the, the actual main uh, building block in the, in the system is the uh, so-called media node. This is like a Swiss army knife at the system. Uh, this is not just the on-air player. Uh, what it does, it, it also uh, streams in and out with RTP, WebRTC, uh, SRT. Uh, it can uh, also stream uh, web type of uh, HLS and uh, ISCAT, that kind of things. This can be installed in, uh, in the cloud, but it can be also in virtual physical environment or in a box. And in, in those occasions, we can also support IP audio, AAS uh, 67, Dante, LiveWire, Witness, whatever, and also analog and digital audio. What this does is that it, it plays, it transcodes, it has internal mixer and level controls. It controls external services like codecs and that kind of stuff. It can also start external. If you want to start the lamp in the studio or coffee grinder, it, uh, it can do that. And uh, then it uh, has messaging. We use active MQ messaging and the web sockets within the system. And uh, we can also control the dist distribution. And what's nice with these media nodes, we can, uh, we can train them so that, for instance, in this configuration, there's main channel feeding uh, a program to regional channels. And uh, with this, we can make localization. 
we can have local uh, parts of the programs and then also local advertisement and that kind of uh, things. Then for, for uh, distribution control to, uh, to take the material to the transmitters or to tower company, uh, for small number of channels, we can do it directly, but for larger installations, we use the two-way, uh, two, we, W, Com, Moin, which we have a, a presentation after this. And naturally we have streaming resources and a legal logger here. And uh, as a one special occasion for this, we have a so-called live concept where you can uh, like extract this live part for small shows and then take this small show system uh, to be a part of a existing broadcaster so that if you have some regional uh, persons having half an hour show or something like that, they can, they can plan, they can run, they can control and run the, and then we get just the stream to the, to the broadcaster leg, uh, legacy system so that we don't have to reboot build everything. What's nice here with the cloud, uh, cloud system is that uh, this is very easy to deploy it's easy to change the configurations, channels, studios, that kind of stuff. It's uh, very fast to start up and train. You can start training before you have all installation stuff. There's no, no fixed hardware costs, very easily scalable, and it's totally location uh, independent. So that's pre pretty much the uh, short story, and now I'm giving back to uh, Barry and uh, guys for for the two way com. Thank you. <laughs> Jay, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, good afternoon, or for the people from the Americas, good morning. Welcome to the webinar from UTEL and to WCOM about radio production and distribution in the cloud. My name is Barry Eskes and I will be your host for this part of the webinar. I will first do a brief introduction about to WCOM and then hand over the microphone to my colleague, Live Cipriani. <clears throat> to WCOM is a technology driven company based in the north part of Germany, very close to the Danish border. We have over 25 years of experience in radio broadcasting and are a manufacturer for hardware and software solutions. It will not be a surprise that 75% of our staff consist of engineers. Let's take a look at our people. Here you will see some of our staff running around in the wild, I should say cycling. It's already two years ago since we attended the IBC in Amsterdam where this picture has been taken. Hopefully in 2022, we will be able to meet you again in person. This slide shows a condensed overview from our hardware products. As you can see, 2WCOM has all products to build and expand your radio network. Audio over IP, MPX over IP codecs, FM DAB monitoring, RDS encoders, satellite receivers, HD radio encoders, and many, many more products, all to support you in building and expanding your network. In 2018, Moin was launched at the IBC in Amsterdam and was directly well received by our customers. The English service provider Akiva selected Moin for their DAB network. And in this application, Moin takes care of contribution and transcoding of really hundreds of audio over IP programs for rebroadcasting into the DAB network. At this moment, we distinguish three versions of Moin. Moin Studio, Moin Streaming, and Moin Distribution. Each version is dedicated for their own application. This picture shows where Moin is located in the UTEL Radio Man application. Well, enough sales talk for now. Let's go to the technical part of Moin. And the technical part will be explained by our CTO, Mr. Live Cipriani, who will explain the core functionality of Moin 
software transcoding solution and how this will fit, fit neatly in UTEL's RadioMan application. Live, over to you. Thank you, Barry. So I will also take over with my screen. Should be available now. Yes. All right. So I'm going to dive into the technical part. I try to make this as simple as possible, but I am one of the 75% of engineers at 2WCOM, so it might be still a bit engineering. Um, let us go in. Um, let us start at the beginning with the word MOIN, because MOIN doesn't, does not only mean media over IP network. It's also a German word, and it means hello or bye, goodbye. Um, it was originally just used in the northern part of Germany or southern part of Denmark. Um, there are also in other languages um, similar words, but um, yeah, it's it's a very popular word in Germany right now. It's more a hipster thing <laughs> to, to use it. Um, but the cool thing about Moin is you can say it at any time of day and to any person. And that is our vision behind the Moin. We want to build an audio IP product that is able to talk to every codec and to a, almost any audio IP software. And that is still our vision um, to this day. And since actions speak louder than words, um, we have also built in a lot of protocols. Uh, you must not know every one of these protocols. I'm not asking questions after this uh, webinar. Um, but just to name a few here is AS67 and SMT ST2110, uh, which are probably the most known audio VIP protocols. DVB transport stream is also used over satellite networks. There are many different IP protocols and uh, even the list that you're seeing here is not every single one of them that we use. Uh, Codex is obviously also a very big thing for interoperability because when you want to decode, encode, or in, in the Moin's case, transcode audio, you must be able to run all these codecs. And we have a very big list of codecs like PCM for uncompressed data, MPEG layer two and three, really all AAC variants, also the new X high efficiency codec. Opus, yeah. And the cool thing is all of them are free of charge except for micro MPX and Dolby because we pay a lot for them uh, to the library uh, suppliers. Uh, that is the reason. But every other codec is for free and we like to have it this way because then you can have the, the nice interoperability that you need. So IP protocols and codecs, that's not where we stop with our interoperability. We are also building a, a very nice management stack around that where you can almost control the entire software using SNMP version two or three, Ember Plus. And we are launching a REST API that is open API compliant. So as you can see, interoperability is a big part uh, in our company and plays a big role. Let us cover some, some basics of the MOIN. Um, for example, the software stack. We, we are able to run this with any number of audio channels. It really just depends on your hardware. Um, just to give you an idea, we can run on one virtual CPU core. We can around, run around 10 stereo audio channels to 40 audio channels, depending on the codec you're using. Our worst case is 10, our best case is around 40 codecs uh, of transcoding. The software is available as bare metal image. That means you can install it directly on, on a hardware server. Um, you can use the same image to install it in a virtual mas machine on VMware, Proxmox, or whatever hypervisor you choose. Or you can dive even deeper and install it on a Docker layer within one of your virtual machines or use our Kubernetes uh, deployment to deploy it uh, also into a Kubernetes cluster that you run. And since we are having Kubernetes, we can also provide uh, the Moin as a cloud service. Uh, of course, then you can run it on premise or in the cloud. Uh, and you can choose depending on your security measures um, and where you want to run this. The Moin has several use cases and the main use cases were the ones Barry has shown us with Moin, Moin for streaming, Moin for distribution, uh, and Moin for Studio. 
Uh, there are some corner cases like contribution where we can select the signals from all the studios uh, together. Um, in the studio part use case, we can transcode all the studios that are within the studio, or measure them or even yeah, monitor them. That's our monitoring part. In the streaming part, we can do ISCA streaming, HLS streaming, what is also provided by UTEL, uh, can also be done with us and streamed over a CDN. But today we are going to focus on the distribution part. And the distribution part, when we talk about that, means distributing the signal uh, to your affiliates or distributing them to real transmitters for FM distribution or digital audio broadcasting di di um, distribution, or even HD radio like our friends in the US use. Um, let us just hang on this, um, this image here for a second. That is the basic principle. Radio Man is providing a very high quality, uncompressed audio stream to our Moin software. They can also provide some codecs as well if you want to run also compressed between those um, instances. And they are co-located in AWS. So we are we are running with the best possible latency by, by putting these uh, two softwares as close as possible next to each other. And then the Moin takes over that audio signal and can distribute it to the transmitters, to studios, to other affiliates, um, and my next step is let us let us zoom in into one of these uh, arrows here, maybe the one to the transmitters, and see what we are what we are using there. Because the latest and greatest protocols, if if you want to call it like this, is RIST and SRT. They are both reliable UDP mechanisms, and they work in a way where they are continuously sending UDP packets from encoder to decoder, and only if a packet gets lost the decoder is able to request that packet and only the packets that were lost and then the encoder can resend them that's also why these protocols are called re-request protocols um, it is very nice compared to tcp ip because you don't have that handshake overhead you're not constantly asking oh have you received that packet um, and are, are not needing the answer for that you're always sending and when you need to resend a packet, you get that request. So that is also why SRT is very good in cloud environments because it has caller mode. That means it can work through firewalls. It can call a remote destination and tell it, please uh, send me over your audio or it can send in audio that way. And that is very nice for secure environments because the ports are just opened when you're calling and they are not open opened all the time. RIST, in contrast to SRT, works with RTP and not on UDP level. So that has all the benefits of RTP timestamping. It's possible to use multicast and audio synchronization on, on RIST. But both protocols are providing very good protection for less bandwidth than forward error correction. And that's a very general phrase. There are some corner cases where FEC might be better, but in, in general, when you want to have a decent protection, um, both of these protocols are using less bandwidth and less latency than forward error correction. The Moin obviously works very well with 2WCOM devices. So you can put your IP4Cs, which, which are our four channel codecs on transmitters and distribute from our software to these codecs. And if you use our products, there are some smaller benefits like we can automatically detect the codec and, and simply decode that codec. And you don't have to do a specific choice and the decoder can follow that decision from the Moin. Um, but as I told you, we are very committed um, to interoperability. That, mean, that means it should work with all our competitors. We have a lot of devices from our competitors over here. Uh, if problems are coming along, please tell us. And we, we are really committed to that and want to fix uh, interoperability problems, which can, of course, occur. Um, yeah, but in general, by using AS67 or EBU tech, uh, those two interoperability protocols, they are very good standards and in general interoperability is pretty great. Um, 
I don't, or I didn't want to stop at with distribution just by showing you the studio transmitter links, because we are missing one big benefit of the Moin then. If, if you're doing regular streaming like Icecast, Shoutcast, or HLS from the Moin, you can actually utilize the same encoder um, for that. So for example, if, if you're already encoding into MP3 and send that as an SRT stream to, to one of your transmitters, you can take exactly the same audio and send it out as an Icecast stream to a CDN. Uh, so you can, you can save on CPU load and saving on CPU load means saving on costs. So uh, yeah, you can send out in, in any format that we are providing from the same audio data. And of course this works with a variety of CDN providers like Akamai, StreamGuys, I think the stream guys people are even on this call, so very warm welcome to our new friends. And Cloudflare is also a possibility that we can provide. One thing that I have seen in, in, and heard in these presentations a lot is cloud native. And I think what does that even mean? And is our mind really cloud native? So I wanted to pick that topic up a bit and since it is a very big buzzword, explain you what we mean by cloud native. And that means it's not working super integrated with AWS because you become dependent on, on either one of these infrastructures um, if, if you're getting too much into bed with AWS or other cloud providers. But Kubernetes points the mind on the right direction for real cloud native um, software solutions. For example, we can use our auto scaling in our cloud environment. That means when, when we require CPU load, the cluster can scale up um, and scale down when, it, when it's not needed anymore. So this is a very nice feature when you have on-demand codecs. For example, you need two audio streams just for 10 minutes, then the cluster can scale up. And when it's not used anymore, it can automatically scale down. That means less costs on our side, so that's also beneficial for you um, because you will see also that uh, on your bill. Then we have automatic DNS entries and certificates. Again, I'm an engineer, it really gets uh, technical if we dive into these topics, but it provides automated mechanisms to really run this stuff in the cloud with uh, security in mind and namespaces, policies, whatever you need to really run this in a cloud environment and, and try to protect one customer from the other customer since they are running next to each other. And Kubernetes lets us run this on any cloud, uh, Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean, um, almost everyone has, has a Kubernetes system. One thing when we're talking about software solutions, what, what I like to put in is of course a bit about security because security is very often a concern when it comes to cloud environments. And a couple of things I want to mention here is we are, we are currently running in a security hardening process because of this election from Akiva, which is the supplier for the BBC. So we, we have to get better in security and it's, it's a very high quality and in, in what they are asking for security reasons. So that is still going on in 2022, but by now we definitely have automated vulnerability scans for each release. And no, we are not <laughs> vulnerable to Log4j, uh, which was a nightmare over the weekend for a couple of our customers, um, but our devices are not affected. Um, yeah, we have a services and firewalling concept. Uh, we support infrastructures like SRT calling um, that works through firewalls. Uh, and we are a member of a subgroup of the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK. Um, so we get some first, first hands um, information when we are seeing big, big threats to infrastructures. Last topic before I will head over to Brian um, is what's coming up, up next for the Moin. We are releasing still in December, so that means next week uh, we have a release coming out that has IceCast metadata insertion, uh, HTTPS for IceCast and HLS, and an NTP synchronization, which is better than plus minus 10 milliseconds. So that's almost not hearable. 
um, which is very good for FM transmitters. And we have our next release planned for February, which should include an HLS decoder and full GPIO forwarding implementation. And I think that's a topic that Brian is interested in, and that's how I give over the virtual microphone to Brian. Thanks. Okay, uh, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brian Wilson. Um, I've been a broadcast engineer for about 45 years. So um, I, I've seen everything uh, from uh, non-computers in the broadcast industry uh, through uh, computers and huge hard drives and, you know, and then, uh, you know, digital audio, AES, analog, and then audio over IP, and then basically us living in an IP world in, in the broadcast industry. So um, anyway, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit back in March of 2020, you know, uh, uh, right now uh, we're working for, you know, national broadcasters doing national uh, newscast programming stuff um, and from a network perspective. So uh, we, we, uh, we feed to a satellite provider who uplinks, you know, our, our programming to a satellite provider. So, um, and they're located in another, another part of the country. Um, so initially we thought the pandemic as everybody else did was only gonna last a couple of weeks, a couple of months. We didn't know what the deal was. So and we have bureaus around uh, the United States. So uh, we kind of moved our operation to another bureau um, and uh, that wasn't really being hit by the pandemic. And at that point we had anchors using IP codex, VPN, uh, and we were able to go back to our main studio, uh, uh, one of our main studios that we switched our operations to. So that looked like that was going to work in the short, short term, but then we realized, you know, long term, uh, we're going to need a solution now, um, which was a cloud solution because it looked like, uh, the, you know, things were getting shut down. People were not going to have to, going to have to work from home. So we needed to find a way that we could provide the, uh, you know, provide the functionality for anchors and copy editors at home to match their on-premises workflow. You want that workflow to be very similar, as close to, to what you can do from home as you could do from, you know, your, your main studio. Um, so we're able to find a web-based cloud solution that would provide, you know, all of that functionality that we needed, content creation, automation playlist, cart walls, so we could play our news actualities, a virtual mixer to mix everything, you know, into a good sounding broadcast. Um, and the big fact was that this was web-based and did not provide uh, uh, people to actually have to load applications, as we know from a security perspective, um, loading applications on, on a company PC uh, can be difficult. Everything has to be vetted through uh, uh, IPsec and, and a lot of other things to make sure for vulnerabilities. But the fact that this was totally web-based um, made the implementation you know, a lot easier. Um, but uh, you know, so the products were there, uh, but weren't there yet. Um, so we still had to take that final mixed product in the cloud and transport it to our satellite provider, you know, which another step you know, in the chain. Um, but now, now that we had all the piece parts, biggest thing we had to consider now, end-to-end -end latency. You know, when you're dealing with the IP transport packets, um, it's, it's IP latency. So uh, we first worked with measuring that latency from the anchor's home to the cloud and through the cloud software application. You know, and in each step, we looked at what data rate we were using, what algorithm we were using for each part of the process, you know, because we, to, to, we wanted to have the required audio quality but then we had a measure to see if the latency was acceptable. So uh, it took many reiterations and, uh, and a lot of testing, you know, down to hundreds of milliseconds um, for each part of the process. As we were looking at to see where could we cut down latency, even if we got a tenth of a second, you know, a couple of a couple of tenths of a second there, a couple of tenths of a second there. As you start adding that up in the chain, you can make your overall latency, you know, a little bit uh, a, a little bit more desirable. Um, but we started to find as we continued our testing that uh, when you do these tests, you want your latency at least to be predictable. Um, and then we found that, you know, depending on how long a connection was up and stuff like that, we were finding now, now that that latency was not consistent and not predictable. So that started to make things a little difficult. <clears throat> so we, we found some solutions uh, for that. Um, and so that we were able to take that cumulative latency, you know, within the cloud and, you know, kind of make it, you know, somewhat acceptable. Um, so we got it to that part, but then that was only through the cloud, uh, to our cloud system. We had our last part of our chain, which was, 
to take it from the cloud and then send it to our satellite uplink provider, which was you know, located in a little part of the, the, uh, the other country. So once again, we had to test that link for latency. Uh, and, and because you know if you've got this great cloud solution, but your last mile isn't robust and reliable, then it's really not a workable solution. You really have to have a full end-to-end -end solution. So initially we were doing this via an MP3 RTP stream and you know that worked okay. Uh, but the reality is long-term reliability was an issue since a stream like that really has no error correction. Um, so then we looked and we found the solution then using Opus with SRT as the transport protocol. And this actually has been proven to be <coughs> a very reliable transport protocol, you know, with its use of ARQ. And as, as Life mentioned, you get the benefits of TCP in your D UDP stream, you know, making it, you know, more robust and, and reliable. Uh, but of course, that benefit of reliability is offset with some additional latency since for ARQ to work, you must add a little bit of an additional buffer delay to allow those retransmission of lost packets. Um, so you really needed to work that trade-off of reliability and latency. And of course, as all the engineers in broadcast will know, that is your constant trade-off dealing in the IP world, reliability and latency. If latency is not an issue, then you don't really have to worry about that. But when you're dealing with real-time audio and you're trying to hit posts and stuff like that, um, you know, you really have to take light latency into consideration, you know, in your, in your flow chain uh, end to end to make sure that it's, it's going to work and it's, and it's going to sound smooth. Um, so uh, we continued to test and make fine tuning at that point until we finally got to what we would be considered, uh, you know, an acceptable, an acceptable latency. Um, the, the good thing is, uh, you know, as, as, as it was mentioned before, is that, you know, um, you can take these streams and do other things with it. And the idea is like, can you take content and somehow use that content for other streams and make other new revenue streams with the similar content? So you've, you've got a single piece of content, but now you've got multiple revenue streams. And that's, that's the key here. So with our cloud solution and SRT transport, where we're able to take that, that same newscast content but then replace the commercials with different ones that we from our organization can traffic. So we can now create traffic schedules from a traffic software, merge it into the cloud uh, with an automation playout schedule. Um, so now we've taken that with another player uh, and now also now with the new Opus and SRT transport stream, uh, we were able to bring that back into the cloud, mix it all up again, and now send out a new stream so this, is, uh, uh, this allows us to leverage that same newscast content to add additional revenue to that stream. Um, so th the key to all of this is that, that the solutions now has given us the ability to originate anywhere in the world. I mean, typically prior to COVID, we did newscasts from our main studio, wherever that be in New York, Washington, you know, since we're US based, um, but now, we particularly have people doing it at their house, doing it while they're on vacation, or if the reporters that have to go to other parts of the world, we've had people do it from Southeast Asia, we've had them do it from Mexico, we've had them do it from Europe, and they're actually able to do their live newscast from a hotel in a conference room where we could secure you know, a, a good space that was gonna be quiet. And with literally a PC and software you know, a PC and just logging on via the web, being able to fully produce broadcasts with that broadcast quality and latency um, that, that is sounding good. So um, that's that's really the big thing here. You know, you're no longer tied to the, what I call the old school way of originating your backhaul at your main studio or bureau or whatever to get your content to the satellite uh, provider. The last thing about this is that this all sounds really, really great. You know, you don't have to be at your main studio anymore. You can, you can originate anywhere in the world, make it sound like you're at your own home studio. But the problem is your, your main studio has certain resources that your home studio doesn't have. That might be power, internet, you know, you really don't have to worry about uh, air conditioning and stuff like that, like you do at, at, at a studio. But the biggest two things that we saw were power and internet at the home, you're at the mercy of your power company um, and you're at the mercy of your ISP. Most people don't have 
double, you know, dual ISPs at home. Obviously, in a lot of these broadcast solutions, if you've got a critical link, uh, you know, all of the vendors pretty much provide you now with dual ISPs to do dual streaming. So, you know, you, you won't go down, you know, hard from, from that particular point. But if you're at home, what do you do? Um, so basically what we found is that for our, most of our, our, major, our major players that are, are a part of our network, uh, we've provided a UPS for them. So now you know, they have a UPS that they will put their broadcast equipment through. So if there is a power hit, most cases you're talking power hits, sometimes you will lose power totally, but you'll take power hits. And of course, if you've got everything going for a UPS and you don't need a huge, you don't need, you know, half a room UPS batteries, but, but, you know, any commercial thing where you can take a power hit or be able to stay on the air for a, a, a couple of hours um, with a, with a decent sized UPS. And then the other thing that we, we've actually put in, in uh, anchors homes is cellular internet. Um, so this way, if your ISP goes down, I mean, some people do have two ISPs, but um uh, that that's still not super 100% reliability. Um, if a pole falls down and they're both they're both coming through, you know, your cable modem. Even if you've got a cable modem and a DSL or something, they're probably on the same pole, getting close to your house. If if you live in, in a neighborhood, so that could take you down. So we uh, we we have a cellular uh, internet connectivity that they have at their house. So if they do lose internet. Um, they can just switch over to cellular delivery. Um, and, you know, since we're talking about audio and not video generally, um, you know, the bandwidth limits, uh, you know, are, 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 are pretty small. So the cost factor isn't, isn't huge there. We don't use the cellular uh, full time. We're only going to use the cellular. Uh, we keep it on so we know it's always working and we can check it everybody's house to make sure everything's good. But we actually only use the data when we, when we have to. So um, they can just switch to cellular. Once again, log on onto the web, get onto their software, do their newscast and get be back in business. So um, it's really opened up the possibilities really now of, of, of anybody really broadcasting from anywhere um, and not the traditional, everybody's gotta be at a major city or wherever your, your business has to be uh, you know, located. So, um, but uh, it took, uh, took a lot of, uh, I gotta admit, it did take a, a bit of, of testing um, you know, a lot of these solutions do work really well, um, but you do have to fine tune them. Um, and, uh, you know, the more you understand about how they work, the easier it is to kind of fine tune and try to find the little hooks to save, like I said, save 10 milliseconds there, save 50 milliseconds there, and save uh, maybe 100 milliseconds there, depending on your algorithm data rate and stuff like that. So you can fine tune it to, to make it uh, work for your broadcast. So now you can sound professional audio from somebody's house um, and it, it to sound timed uh, and sound really good. And once again, sound reliable. So uh, a lot of these solutions, uh, you know, that have come up in the last, you know, two or so years um, have, have really improved the reliability and to, and to really open up the new door for broadcasting. I mean, I, I, I can't see a lot of organizations going back to having 50 people, you know, at a bureau anymore. I think it's definitely going to continue in a hybrid mode um, where some stuff might be done in a studio that's super complex. Other stuff will be done, you know, uh, at other locations and stuff like that. I really think that that is basically the future of of broadcasting and part of it will be cloud some of it will be on premises and the idea is that you have both so you can you can leverage both of them the on premises stuff along with the cloud stuff but if something happens i mean you know we've, we've all been in disaster recovery scenarios over the last 20 plus years this is basically disaster recovery you don't you can do stuff from your house now and not have, not be in a not be in a main studio office so um, that's pretty much uh, the end of my presentation. And I'm, I'm really glad that the, uh, the vendors have come up with really great solutions uh, for us to uh, continue to, uh, to broadcast. Thank you, Brian. And then we could, we could uh, have a look on the couple of questions we have. I think this is uh, for, for Jorma and Olli Pekka. Shall we go them through? through answering them, them live. So how do you compensate for latency between live mix and music play out from the cloud when voice tracking? Okay, so, uh, so for, uh, for making the voice tracking, actually what we do is that um, 
uh, when you are listening, the one uh, person who is speaking, uh, the voice track, when he's listening, he actually uh, hears the, uh, a play from the local browser. Uh, so that there is a uh, smaller bitrate version running on his browser. And what, what it means is that it's actually very accurately timed. And we just take the timing information and then transfer the, transfer the recording and the time markers to the server itself. So, so there's no problem in uh, in network latency, and uh, for the latency parts, uh, for instance, if you want to um, have your audio, uh, your speak, and uh, your starting of a, for instance audio play to be as close to uh, as possible, we we have actually be built so that. From the workstation, when you uh, speak, you get um, uh, WebRTC audio to the uh, node, media node, which is in the cloud. And we actually uh, embed also the control uh, information into the same WebRTC stream so that if there's, uh, if the delays change, so also the, the starting delay change these. Uh, so that's like one part of taking those milliseconds away and making it feasible. Um, and uh, other, otherwise we are using uh, Ac active MQ and that kind of controls, but for those we have done so. Thank uh, you. And the next one, uh... What can you share about the infrastructure requirements to host Radioman? Is it traditional uh, VM-based deployment or does it leverage container technology? Um, it's so that uh, most of the uh, most of the installations running at this moment uh, are uh, running on a on a traditional VM-based. Uh, uh, infrastructure within the cloud, but uh, internally we are, for instance, all our development we are we are running on containers and so on. So, and there's a uh, performance, uh, let's say, tune-up work going on on containerization of uh, putting bits and pieces to other containers and so on. So that's ongoing. As well as, uh, as Leif uh, mentioned, uh, hardening of the uh, security uh, things. We, we are doing the same thing at the moment uh, with our stuff. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's ongoing. There is a third question also uh, do we have still time? Uh, yeah, yeah, Olli Pekka, you can, you can go ahead with, with that one. Okay, so that's a long question. Yes, we built a radio station pro for WordPress that allows stations to build and display a show schedule, display shows, episodes, and segments. Can I pull the schedule from the API to publish WordPress? And does your software allow for multiple schedules? And is, is there, can it do overrides or repeat designations? Um, actually, what uh, what we uh, it is possible to do that from the from the API, and uh, because the API we have yeah, all all the user interfaces, everything in Radium and use is the same API. So everything that's possible is possible. Uh, uh, typically, what we do in this kind of uh, publishing is that we we actually send them. When something, for instance, changes or there's a new, a new uh, program or something like that coming, we send a, uh, a message. The message containing, uh, um, let's say, basic information, and then also the the URL to for for the 
more information to API and so on. So it's it's possible, but uh, for the details, we must uh, have some discussions. Okay, thank you. I think we are we are running running out of time here, so I will uh, uh, answer answer the rest of the rest of the questions by by email after this webinar. Um, so I I thank for the for the attendees for your for your interest towards our our webinar today, and of course the panelists. Thank you, thank you for your for your presentations and your your insights in radio production and distribution in the cloud. Yes, and uh, please contact for questions and that, that kind of things. We certainly are going to give you good information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a good, you very much. good evening. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Brian. Bye-bye.